Então, nós vamos continuar agora com, com o Peter. O Peter é uh, cofundador uh, de um dos primeiros uh, centros de vida independente na, na, na Suíça. <coughs> E vamos falar um pouco sobre como é que tudo isto está agora a funcionar na, na Suíça. Um, vou agora mudar para inglês. Uh, Peter, uh, good to have you. Uh, really appreciate your, your time with us. And uh, the floor is yours. So, anyone, you can start. Yeah. I think I would, would like to start with a warning. Uh, I think it's very dangerous to compare the different systems in the different countries without knowing the background on which these systems were built. I think if, if you want to learn from different countries, you have to learn also the background that led to the solution that was uh, true in this country and led to the methods by which uh, we were able to get to that solution. So I think this has always to be kept in mind. Uh, so I will start with the background. In Switzerland, we had already a rather well-functioning national invalidity insurance that is supposed to uh, reimburse money that you don't earn because of your invalidity. It's called invalidity. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. So, uh, In the public, this insurance is considered responsible for everything that concerns disabled people, which I think is a, a problematic situation. I think uh, many things that concern disabled people should not be talked about in the framework of insurance, but in the framework of general human rights, for instance, or general rights. But anyway, that was the situation. Uh, within that situation we had already in 1996, when we started our work, we had what, what was called uh, an impotence allowance. That was a little bit of money considered by the politicians to be uh, money for presents to give to people who worked voluntarily for us. Not really to give them a salary because it was ridiculously small, but to give a certain amount of, of money or whatever present. And this impotence allowance was measured out by, three, by several criteria which you had to fulfill, but it was uh, uh, separated into three different levels, level, low level, middle level, and high level. The high level was about 900 euro monthly. So that the basic idea that you have to pay or to give something to the people that work for you was already in the minds of the politicians. But this, uh, space, this uh, impotence allowance was not given, principally not given, to people with intellectual or psychiatric disabilities. They had no right. One of the changes that happened in, 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 while we were working was that the organization of the people with psychiatric disabilities fought for uh, allowing also people with psychiatric disabilities to get this personal allowance, this uh, impotence allowance. And the parliament decided, yes, they can get it, but only half as much as people with physical disabilities. Can I ask why? Anyway, it's not, uh, it's not an equal solution. We had also a, no a national insurance, a health insurance, that everybody has to be health insured in Switzerland by, uh, usually it's connected to working at a profession, but everybody has to have one. It's private companies, but you have to be registered and to pay for one of these health insurances. And the health insurance, uh, had introduced, before we started our fight, a service that's called Spitex, which means uh, hospital uh, support at home. The idea was that if people could get some medical support when they get home from hospital, they could be sent home earlier, and thus you could save um, the expensive uh, hospital treatment. 
So there also there was a certain money, but this could only be used by law for three months. That was about the situation. And we had several hundred of private disability organizations uh, for any special disability from here to there had its own organization, sometimes even two, three organizations for the same type, subtype of disability uh, in the different cantons of the country. A very, very uh, complex system. And most of these organizations were subsidized by the government to give out services to disabled people by demand. So, the, so that means that if disabled people would come to them, they would check if they are eligible and then, for instance, they would give them cheaper diapers or access to a, a special bed or things like that. This was not done by the, by the national insurance, this was done by private companies. And last but not least, sorry if I have to smoke, but that's me. Uh, last but not least, we have a political system in Switzerland that is totally geared to be very stable. That means we have the same parties in our government for the last 50 years. It's just a little changes of the weights of the different parties, but all the, the major parties are part of the government. Uh, and so usually political decisions take very long. They are very carefully considered from all sides. Uh, it's, there's a saying that in Switzerland, the new law needs at least 10 to 15 years before it comes into power. Uh, we had 15 years. We fought 15 years for personal assistance, uh, which is exactly how it went. So I will tell you a little bit what we did in order to get, get that. First of all, it has been mentioned here also, in Switzerland, there was a tradition that every disability kind would care for himself, for themselves. Uh, our approach was learning from all other movements, especially from Sweden and from Germany and so on, that we have to do uh, to fight cross the disability approach. That means we have to try to find different people from different disabilities and work together with them and develop models that would answer to the needs of different kinds of people with disabilities and have examples of these people so that nobody could say, yeah, you know, you're only these and all the others can't and so on. That was one major point which we always cared for very seriously, try to have as many people, different people from as many different disabilities as possible. Second, our, our clear intention was from the very beginning, direct payment. We learned from what happened in Germany with the civil, uh, civil uh, service people. We learned from what happened in Sweden. We learned from what happened in Austria and in the United States. And we said direct payment, time, direct payment, direct payment. There is no other solution than direct payment. And we wrote a very extensive paper, about 50 pages, where we explained the idea of direct payment and its advantages over uh, all kinds of indirect payments, which were payments to institutions. Uh, one of the arguments that was very important, especially on the right side of the political parties, was that the control is much better. If you give the money directly to the people, so you know that the money is there for their for the use, you, you gave it to them. If you give it to an institution, you don't know how much the institution will use up of that money for all kinds of different things that do not serve the purpose of the, that is intended, namely to make the life better for people with disabilities. So direct payments, and we consider personal assistance as a special case of direct payment. Our argument was that direct payment could answer many, many problems also in the field of assistive means like wheelchairs, hearing aids, and so on and so on. If we have direct payment, we have a direct interest to keep our uh, the assistive means in good order, to get the best for the least money, and so on and so on, which, is, which are arguments that are quite good also on the right 
political side. Uh, we also saw that one of the major central problems is how to, to measure the needs of people. This is a very difficult question. And so from the very onset of our fight, like even 1997 or something like this, we started to develop our own instrument. We considered all kinds of factors, you know, do you do it like a butcher from the different parts of the body that injured, or do you do it like uh, the question of what this person does, which is not fair because people who do not work, for instance, why should they get less comfortable uh, services for their home and so on. So we try to get a mixture of all these measures and to, to propose to the politicians a fixed uh, measurement scale that we had uh, got, uh, uh, put into an Excel spreadsheet so that it was ready. It could be used, it could be tried, it could be improved and so on and so on. And we also uh, from the very beginning, we were very clear that we want direct payment according to the hours we need, multiplied by a standard salary. That was our approach. We said we want to measure how much we need with this instrument, turn that into money and send it to our bank account. That's the way we want to do it. Then we had a lot of other demands. We worked also for anti-discrimination law and for access to public transportation and so on. All these things are not directly related to disability, uh, to personal assistance, but they are very important. I mean, if you don't have access to public transportation, you can't go to work. If you can't go to work, uh, your assistance will not be very useful for those people who would like to go out to go to work. If you don't have housing, it doesn't help you to have personal assistance if you don't find an apartment and so on and so on. So we connected these things together with it and fighting for the personal assistance was one approach, but one central approach. Now I'll be a little bit about our activities. First of all, and was mentioned before in the speeches, we uh, decided to con concentrate very much on financial issues. We decided that politics is not about moral, politics is not about good and bad, politics is about money. At least in Switzerland it's like this. People, at the end, they want to know how much does it cost, where from do you take the money, and that's all. And if you have a, a solution for that, you can talk to them. If you don't have a solution for that, you get very nice words, but you get nothing. So we concentrated on money, money, money. And one of the first things we did uh, after publishing a paper on the advantages of uh, direct payments, we uh, were invited to a, a national a group of a, a working group of the national policy insurance, uh, invalidity insurance to participate in uh, discussing possible future models for financing uh, care. Uh, the one condition they said beforehand was that it should not cost more than the, the, the system we have now. Which is a funny thing because we are immediately answered that's a very good idea, but do you tell us what the current system costs? And then it came out that nobody knows what the current system costs because nobody calculates all the costs that institutions actually produce. And that was one of the tasks we put to ourselves. And I have to mention here one of our great, great, great workers that is Katarina Kanka. By the way, she has a little house in Portugal. Uh, unfortunately, she doesn't speak English. Katarina Kanka sat down for two years and collected all the sources of money that run into the institution system. We identified 16 different sources of monies that run into the institutional system. And we added all these and got a very high sum. And this sum we divided by the number of people in the institutions. And we showed to the politicians that 
every person in these institutions costs about 450 euro a day. Now, you might think that's a few, you might think that's a lot, but if you compare it to a pl place in a nice uh, hotel, for instance, it's quite a good money. Or if you compare it to the salaries of uh, persons working for you, you could actually employ two to three people for only one person, eight hours a day with that money, even in Switzerland where salaries are very high. Politicians were shocked. We uh, organized a big national conference where we invited all the specialists for uh, healthcare financing of the different big parties and uh, the specialists for financing from the national insurance and from the government themselves and put them in a room in the middle of a room and all around there were several dozens of people with disabilities so they could watch directly how the politicians try to avoid talking really about stuff and in the middle we put our numbers and said look that's the numbers and that's what we want with this with this money we want this money to go directly to the people with disabilities there is more than enough money if you give it to the people with disabilities themselves uh, there was big shock there was a, a lots of doubt about our numbers later the office for statistics uh, not only approved our numbers they said we were very careful not to put high harm numbers we could have put higher harm numbers but this was one of our, of our major arguments in the politics we know the numbers for the first time in switzerland <coughs> sorry and with these numbers we can do it we also separated the, the big lump into the different groups we have the group with a low uh, impotence allowance with middle impotence allowance with high impotence allowance we know how many there are so we can uh, approximately uh, divide this money according to the higher middle or low needs of the people and still show that we have about three times as much money as we actually need that was a very efficient political uh, way we didn't get any response from the leftist party negative responses more and from the middle parties no interest at all they were absolutely not interested to talk to us of course we were considered very radical but then at this aquarium situation one of the most rightist uh, persons there started to talk with us after the seminar and said my boss the chief of the most rightist party is interested in that model and that was for us an opening so our katarina kanka went to him i couldn't because i can't stand these people i have to say <laughs> but she did she succeeded to talk to them and they were very much interested in the model not for our reasons of course they calculated that if they would use that model health for uh, health care for the disabled would cost much less and that was their main interest of course and they liked the idea of personal responsibility that everyone would be personal responsible and the politicians had control that this money really went to disabled people and not to all kinds of uh, unions and uh, all kinds of things that they don't like so much. The moment the rightist parties showed interest and it was seen all over the place, we got openings with all the parties. Suddenly all the parties wanted an interview with our people, wanted to talk to us about the model, wanted to see what the model is about. And that was the final breakthrough. It took about two to three to four years until we got this breakthrough and, and the sudden interest of, on all sides. Uh, we also, uh, one of the methods we had was a, a, a newsletter. We were the first in Switzerland to publish a newsletter in the field of disability. There, there were no organized, the private organizations 
didn't ever think about the idea of publishing a newsletter. What, what for? So <laughs> we published a newsletter and we were very, let's say, not nice. The newsletters were attacks, 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 attacks. We published what these organizations do, what we criticized. We uh, really shamed them again and again and again. Week after week, this newsletter went out and it was read. It was read by about 600 representatives of all the big organizations and it, it was the talk in that scene. And it started to have influence. People wanted you know, to talk with us. They wanted to talk about this model. They wanted to talk about ideas. And last but not least, of course, we did lots of other things. We make demonstrations and we sent out uh, letters to different politicians and so on. But one of the most important thing was that our Katharina Kanka collected a number of politicians from all the different parties in Switzerland who were supporting our model. From the very right to the extreme left, uh, it was once said this was the only subject in Swiss politics where these people spoke to each other. And she made uh, working groups with them and explained them the model and listened to their, uh, you know, doubts and what they thought was not good and what could happen and went home and we talked about it and we tried to find solutions for the problems and went back to the next meeting with these people so that at the end, we had a very strong group in our backing that forced the national invalidity insurance to finally open the model that we wanted and to start discuss realization of that problem. And this group accompanied the whole process from the very start throughout this, uh, until the end, until our big celebration of the end, and always checked again and again that the solution that we got was the solution we promised to them. That's the solution we want. So this, this was very effective. What is the situ situation today? We have now, for six years now, we have the so-called allocation for assistance, which is a new kind of allowance within the system of the invalidity insurance. That was very interesting because it was exactly all the speakers before said that there were cuttings, you know, cuttings everywhere. This is a political wave that went over Europe, Europe after Thatcher and, and Reagan. Uh, cut, cut, cut in the health systems. And in Switzerland, we had that too. We, there was a tremendous pressure on the invalidity insurance to cut costs. But at the same time, and this is, was just lucky because we had this group of politicians, there was a new allowance introduced into the law. Uh, it was considered to cost 50 million, I think, was the first budget. And we all said there won't be that many people at the beginning. This is a new model. People need role models. People who lived in an institution for 10 years, they don't believe you that they can do it. They have to see people with disabilities more severe than themselves do it. And this takes time. It will be a slow process. Uh, but, you know, the, the politicians were afraid there would be tremendous costs. Uh, they had a, a, a pilot phase that was for two years, 250 people from three different cantons, one town canton, one very country, one in the middle, got personal assistance according to our uh, assessment instrument. And the, the pilot was accompanied by a very large group of uh, studies from different universities, five different studies were accompanying the whole thing on all different aspects, including is it good for the people who work with disability today, and so on and so on. But the results were so drastically clear in favor of our model 
that nobody could say no after that. I, I, it was just, there was not one case of these 250 who did not say that their life improved dram dramatically since they had this personal assistant. Some of them came out of institutions for this experiment. Some of them lived outside, but none of them experienced a life worse than before, which is obvious if you think about it. Anyway, we knew it, but politicians have to have a study. Uh, today, about 2,400 people in Switzerland have personal assistance today. That's not very, few, not, not very much. It, it started with about 2,000 people who waited for a long time for that thing and, and fought politically. And since then it grew by about 400 people. The numbers are increasing very slowly, 20, 30 per year. Uh, there's no waiting list. Uh, one of the reasons why it, why it increases so slowly is that we found out that disability organizations, these hundreds, do not inform their clients that there is such a, uh, an allowance. And the disability insurance by law does not inform the clients that there is such an allowance. That means if you don't know it, you don't get it. It's very difficult though to get to get to many of these disabled people because they're one in institutions closed in and others are within families who have no interest in, in political development. They know that's, that's what there is and they're not informed that there are other possibilities. Also, you perhaps know, and this is important, some of the resistance against personal assistance comes from families. Families enjoy the lovely idea that they have a son or a daughter they can care for for all their life. And the idea of personal assistance who comes into the family and destroys that lucky, uh, at the future where you can have a baby even if he's 60 years old for the rest of your life that is something that is as many many families have difficulties with that and one of the things you have to consider when you give uh, when you give uh, support to people to go into the model of personal assistance you have to consider how to work with the parents you have to find a way to support the parents to give them the security that they are not useless. We always said, look, now you can be parents. We don't have to be nurse anymore. You can be parents. You can concentrate on that, what parents do for their children. So, uh, still persons with psychiatric or learning disabilities. Ah, I might, forgot to mention, the whole model was delayed for more than two years because the politicians didn't want children and people with psychiatric and intellectual disabilities to get that money. And we said, no deal with us. We will not discuss a model that, does, that excludes these people. If we have this, we want it for everyone. And we were very, very strict about that. We had many temptations. Many politicians said, yeah, and you know, it's the first step to that. And then later we can discuss. And we all said, no, this is the basic idea that all persons with disabilities who have need for assistance should be able to apply. And we check how can we help them so that they can use this possibility. But still today, persons with psychiatric and learning disabilities, they can receive, but the conditions are so difficult conditions defined by the politicians are so difficult that almost none of them can reach them. So they have to live alone. They have to be a, to work either in a general workplace, not a, a, a so-called secured workplace. They have to be able to do their own, to do their own calculations and uh, everything like that. So this is one major problem for them. Uh, people with psychiatric disabilities have a special, we have had special provisions for them. For instance, they have uh, waveforms in their disabilities. So we can actually adapt 
the personal assistance according to the very shortly changing uh, waveform of their disability, of their psychiatric disability. It's a provision that's there, but still the organization, the big organization that is responsible in Switzerland for the for the uh, support of people with psychiatric disabilities hasn't informed those people in the last seven years about this possibility. So that's the political reality we have. Children can also receive uh, personal assistance. This was a, a very tragic and lucky situation. We had one child almost dying because its mother, his mother, her mother could not stand, could not give the services anymore that this child needed. And we made it public. We went to the big newspaper and made a big tear story about it and said, look, this mother needs now personal assistance for that child, otherwise the child will die. And since this was in all the media, it was a very big story, with this mother, with this child, and with the whole situation, politicians in the last minute agreed to have the children inside. So children can also receive it. Which is one of the things you have to learn, I think. Use adverse situations good. It's, it's, sometimes it's a luck situation that you have something terrible, dramatic happening. And you think, oh, what terrible thing. And you have to think, that's our opportunity. This we can use in the media. This we can use to, to get one step further, which we did. Uh, in theory, we can use the money freely. That means we all only have to write up the hours and after the, at the end of the month, we send a bill to the National Invalidity Insurance with our confirmation that these were the hours that somebody worked for us. And then the insurance imburses us these hours at a fixed rate. So we get the money after one month on our bank account. It's not quite free, in, and you asked about changes in, lately, and I have to say yes, there were changes lately. Uh, administrations have uh, innate uh, quality that they always want to more want to have more information. They want to know more, to control more, always. It will always be like that, I think. And in our case, for instance, at the beginning, we only had to send the bill. We had received uh, the the first uh, assessment. After the first assessment, we had received a number of hours we could take, and we had. Got, we, we received the form, and with the form we sent in the bill. After about three or four months, the administration wanted also to see our work contracts. We have a direct contract between the disabled person and the assistant, and this contract has to be according to the law, legal, totally. And there are lots of things that you have to think about when you do such a contract, but even the fact that we were not any more free to formulate our contracts the way we thought correct, but the, the insurance wanted to contract, control every single contact. One more restriction I have to mention, family members are not allowed to be employed, none. And we are not allowed to use companies, organizations, or so on for our assistance needs. Our model is based on the idea that the disabled person is the employer and the assistance is the employee. That's basic. And so since we fought for that, it turned out against us for those people who need uh, some kind of uh, exterior organizations to support them, of course. But we have received also hours within the assistance budget for the administration of the assistance budget. So there is a certain amount of hours, depending on how much assistance you need. Uh, so there has been slight changes by the need of the, of, the, of the administration to control, not really by the law. Uh, if you look at the users, there was a com companion study. The users are usually with a rather high assistance need but not with the extreme need. 
because the amount of resistance you can get per day is eight hours. Now you, you know by yourself, there are not many people with high assistance needs that eight hours are enough, but that's the limit. And since this is the limit, people with higher needs, sometimes they manage together with assistance and family and so on, but very often they don't. So this is one of the things that has to change, that this limit was introduced somewhere very late and we weren't very careful about, you know, the, the direct formulation of the law. And so they did it. And, and at the end, we were confronted with that new high upper limit. So this is one of the things. Uh, yeah. What you asked also is the who does the assessment and how. And as I said, we have this assessment instrument. Actually, the government or the in invalidity insurance uses the assessment instrument we developed more or less. There were some slight changes and so on. But the assessment instrument is an Excel spreadsheet where questions are asked and what the person answers is translated into minutes per day. And this calculates directly at the end in a sum that the person gets. And there are lots of secondary questions and there are lots of special cases. It's a very, uh, very long assessment. And you can imagine people are crying after that because you have to show what you can do. And for us disabled people, it's very difficult to show other people what we can do. We are usually are proud of what we can do. And, and then to go and, and show everything you can do. To the last details, can you clip your fingernails? Can you wash your ass? Can you, you know, uh, can you have sex? And so on. So it's difficult and it's painful. And people are crying afterwards. But we tell them there is no way around it. I mean, if we want a budget that suits to your needs, we have to know your needs. It, there is no way around it. There was the, the Swedish model at the beginning where they said, okay, obviously you need, you get it. But this is over. And at the end, you, can, you can't come around the assessment. And if you develop, you in Portugal develop the assessment. You have a chance that you can put in things that the government will never want to put in because you have a reason. You can, for instance, uh, taking care of your parents when they are old or of your children or of your dog and so on and so on. These are things that we need for our life and, and we have to think about it. So uh, there's one basic assessment at the beginning. And if, you, if your disability changes, you are supposed to go to the disability insurance and tell them, my, my needs have changed, I want a new assessment. This you can have any time. <clears throat> and also, after the first decision, you can uh, tell them, look, I don't agree, this has been measured wrong, this was a misunderstanding, and so on and so on. So you can do some little change, but later on, you can come and say, my disability has changed, I have more needs, and it works. They will do a, a new assessment. Okay, now the funding of this whole thing is through the disability, the invalidity insurance, as I said before. Uh, the, the assistants are reimbursed by a standard salary, which is 32 hours, uh, 32 euros per hour. That's the standard for all people, except for night work. In night work, there is not a count of the various minutes. In night work, you have either a low, a medium, or a high need for night work, uh, which is very difficult to get. And you get a certain lump sum for that night, which does not pay for eight hours night work. It pays for perhaps in the best case for two hours of night work and in the insurance is very clear about night starts at eight in the evening and stops at eight in the morning so all the hours you take between eight in the evening and eight in the morning which is the time when many people go to bed and need a lot of assistance is not covered by the night 
So you have to think about it during the day and cut your hours during the day so that during the night you can use that money, but you can't pay the person like the law actually would require, you can't pay the person a higher salary for night work than for the day work. So that's what it is. Okay, what is more? Uh, we train our assistants by ourselves only. At the beginning, uh, when this new model was introduced, we had support groups. We made a group of people from the surroundings of Zurich the big surroundings of Zurich and invited them to come once a month to our center and discuss their problems between themselves. From the very beginning, we did not want to, to support them in a way that they would become dependent on us. We always said, you know, all of us, you have some knowledge. And if you come together, we can give you the, the facts, the, the things the law requires and so on and so on, the paperwork. But the idea is what to do with a specific situation in your situation or in your situation. You have better ideas than we have. So give each other, and we had this support group for almost three years. They met every month and discussed the problems they found, you know, problems with finding assistance, problems with uh, conflicts with assistance, problems with getting rid of assistance, and so on and so on. <coughs> And it was quite good, but at the end, after th about three years, nobody had more need. They all found we can do it by ourselves. Uh, we don't. If we have a question, we send you an email. And usually we gave, of course, uh, personal support, either by email, by telephone, or by meeting. Uh, but there was no great need. The people really managed quite well. I mean, the papers were good that they got from the very beginning the system was relatively simple to understand and so most people managed quite well more problems we had with parents as i said before so we made also a parent group and, and had parents discuss and encourage each other to give their big children <laughs> more uh, freedom and more possibilities uh, also that didn't work for a long time. People found they don't need it. Yeah. Uh, if you ask who supports these people with the intellectual or, or psychiatric disabilities today, factually, it's their families. If they don't have a family that supports them, they can't do it. But they are not allowed to live within their family. One of the conditions is that they have to have their own apartment. So usually families, I tell them, get an apartment near you, just the next door, a, a small apartment. And so you can help, but the person has an own apartment. So. As you see, I, there are many things that can be improved, of course. Uh, it's actually the system, if I compare it to whatever I heard from, from you or from Germany, from everywhere, it's quite a good system, actually. I think we did a, quite a good step. Provided that it's not getting worse like in many other countries. The limit of eight hours excludes a whole group of people with severe disabilities. And this is not fair and it's not, not right. And this has to be changed. The government promises that after 10 years of experience, the improvements that we demand will be considered, whatever that means. The, the assessment is very stingy on the single minutes that it allows. One example talked about today was going to the toilet. It's actually like that, that you get three minutes for support for going to the toilet. Which of course, for most people with a severe disability is not enough. But the argument of this insurance is the actual HELP Act takes only three minutes. A person has to be present, but the assistant can do other things in the meantime. So that's the argument why we get only three minutes per uh, walk to the toilet, huh? per use of the toilet, let's say. Uh, and of course, one of the major problems that is this whole model is geared to persons with physical disabilities, not to, person, to other persons. And this is very bad. Also, it's very bad that only 
if you have applied for this uh, allowance before you're 65, before you go into pension, you can get it also after pension. That means people with 66 who have an accident and uh, are disabled cannot receive personal assistance. There is no model for elderly people, which we think is very stupid because being in a home for the elderly, which what many people are, is very, very, very expensive. And it disconnects the connection between this person and his natural surrounding, and his family and everyone. The administrative requirements are quite difficult for some people and also there, there could be some uh, ways to improve. And of course, one of the bigger problems we have is that the, the traditional disability organizations, which are many and which are powerful and which have a lobby in the parliament, have no interest in developing that idea and in supporting that idea. And so we had, just before I went into pension two years ago, we had an effort and uh, collected uh, signatures to force the government to connect subsidies to disability organizations to the UN Convention. We said, you know, it doesn't make sense that the government signs a UN Convention and then doesn't do anything to realize it in Switzerland. And one way to do that is to tell all the disability organizations that got subsidies, you have to help and to show us a plan how you realize the UN Convention on per, uh, of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and only then you can get money from the government. So that's our ideas of improvement. And with that, I finished. Thank you, Peter.